Can you see my screen okay? Yes, sir, we see them. Fantastic. All right, so we're gonna do a, a, a short update on spirometry interpretation. And let's see if I can advance this. And uh, I don't have any commercial conflicts of interest. And really our, our objective here is to briefly review, re review recent updates to pulmonary function recommend, uh, testing recommendations that were published by the American Thoracic Society and European uh, uh, Respiratory Society over the last couple of years. And I've listed them here. Uh, and uh, also to become familiar with the new GLI Global Spirometry Reference Equation uh, that was recommended to be used. So we'll start with a bit of an introduction, then we'll review those recent recommendations and the equation, and then we'll have a little bit of time for discussion. And just to start out with, uh, I'm going to uh, play a short clip uh, to show the currently recommended approach to doing simple spirometry. So I'll, hopefully this will run. Those clips on. I want to be sure that you can't breathe through your nose. And, uh... This mouthpiece is like a snorkeling mouthpiece, so I need your lips over the outside portion of it and your teeth go behind it, teeth bind down with two tabs. And just want to be sure your tongue is not including the the, uh, the, the hole in the mouthpiece. And just want you to begin with some normal. So they're breathing. recommending using the flow volume loop method. So he's taking a few normal uh, breaths, and then he'll take a deep breath and do the four-stick respiratory maneuver. Keep blowing, keep blowing, keep going. You're doing great. Keep going, keep pushing out, keep pushing, keep pushing. Fast your breath all the way back in. Okay, that's the inhalation, and then that's the full flow volume loop. And you take those nose clips off. Go ahead and put the nose clips on. Okay, so there's the simple test, and here's what you get off the test. And I'm sorry for those that aren't, you know, that are on the phone that can't see this, but you can see here on the left, the flow volume loop where, you know, you uh, start at, uh, uh, you know, full inhalation and blow out and you, your flow peaks up very quickly and then comes back down and then the inhalation on the negative uh, side of the axis, so the full loop. Uh, the current technology for doing spirometry uses uh, flow sensors. So basically what you're measuring is when you blow through the flow sensor, it's measuring your flow over time. Uh, then what it can do is it can integrate your flow over time to give volumes and draw the traditional volume time curve, which you see here on the right, uh, where again, people are starting uh, uh, at the uh, a fully uh, inhale, after full inhalation and they're blowing, blowing, blowing uh, until they get out uh, to as uh, empty as they can. Uh, so that's what you get. And, and this is a pretty simple test. It's been around since the 1940s, and it's hard to believe, but there have been a lot of major uh, recommendations for changes in the way uh, that we do and look at this test. One of them it was the recommendation a couple of years ago for using pretty routinely using the uh, flow volume uh, method, the loop method, instead of just the expert exhalation only method. The exhalation only method where you just take a deep breath and put the sensor in your mouth and blow is still okay, but they, they recommend this other method for reasons I'll show you in just a bit. Okay, so here's the first set of recommendations I'm gonna go over, which is the standardization of spirometry 2019 update that was published a couple of years ago. And this update focused a lot on the uh, technicalities of doing spirometry. Uh, and uh, and I'm going to focus in what I talk about on just on issues that are related to interpretation. And one big part of interpreting spirometry is that it is very much a you know, a uh, um, uh, a quality dependent test where the person doing the test has to do it properly, and the technician has to supervise the the person and. And there are a lot of metrics to assess the quality of spirometry that are laid out in this update. Uh, so one is uh, having a back at extrapolated volume of less than 5% of F FVC or 100 or 0.1 liter, 100 milliliter, whichever is greater. Uh, and I'll go over that in just a minute. Uh, no evidence of a faulty zero flow setting, and we'll go over that. 
uh, no cough in the first second of expiration. And you can see a cough in the first second of expiration uh, makes your FEV1 invalid, although you still might be able uh, to get an FVC out of it. Uh, no glottic closure in the first second of expiration. Uh, uh, must achieve one of these three uh, end of forced expiration indicators. EOFE is end of forced expiration indicators. So this is really important for your FEC that somebody blows out completely. So they need to blow until they get an expiratory plateau of less than or equal to 25 milliliters in the last one second of expiration, expiratory time greater than 15 seconds, or the FEC is within the repeated tolerance or is greater than the largest prior observed FVC, especially important for kids. Uh, no evidence of obstructed mouthpiece or spirometer. No evidence of leak is more important for volume spirometers, which are hardly used anymore. And then this is the reason why they're recommending using the loop instead of just uh, the ex expiration only technique is that if the maximal inspiration after after the end of forced expiration is greater than the FEC. So if somebody inhales in a greater volume uh, than they blew out, uh, then the forced inspiratory vital capacity minus forced vital capacity must be less than uh, a 0.1 liter, less than 100 milliliter, or 5% of the FEC, whichever is greater. So this is the reason why they recommend the loop now is because of this quality criterion. Okay, so a little bit of expa uh, expansion on this, back extrapolated volume. Uh, when someone blows, if they blow hard uh, uh, from the very uh, uh, beginning, uh, this is smaller than if they sort of lays into it. And here's an example of it. So uh, in order to determine time zero uh, for the forced expiratory maneuver, you draw a line like this red line here uh, through the, uh, uh, you know, through the, the, um, uh, through the uh, um, uh, uh, through the flow volume uh, you know, through the I'm sorry through the volume time curve through the steepest part of it and you you go back to get to your time zero so your time zero isn't when the blow starts the time zero is where this line that's parallel to the steepest part uh, of the volume time curve is and this volume uh, between uh, the time zero. Uh, and when the person started blowing is what's called the back extrapolated volume. And if somebody really, if somebody uh, lases into uh, the uh, uh, the um, uh, their blow, if they don't blow hard right away, the back extrapolated volume may be higher. And if uh, uh, you know, if the back extrapolated volume is too high, then it's not an acceptable blow. Uh, in terms of zero flow errors. Uh, with flow spirometers, uh, you have to zero the spirometer before you have the person blow in the spirometer. And if the spirometer is, uh, it isn't zeroed, it can either be a negative uh, zero flow error, error where, the spirometer, where the sensor is actually dropping volume over time or dropping flow over time, uh, or it can be a positive flow error uh, where it's uh, uh, sensing positive of flow over time. Uh, and so, for example, with your volume time curve, if you have a negative flow error, it, it, the curve keeps dropping down instead of flattening out. If you have a positive flow error, uh, the curve keeps going up and it never flattens. And so it's really important to zero the spirometer. Uh, cough in the first second. Here's an example of cough in, in the first second with the volume time curve uh, where you have this uh, dip here. You can also see it in, uh, in the flow volume uh, loop here. A partially blocked mouthpiece. If somebody gets their tongue in the way or their dentures in the way of blowing, you can see wobbling uh, in the volume time curve. Uh, you, can, you can also see it in the flow volume curve. Glottis closure. Uh, you can have an abrupt flattening here, which you can see, uh, and that drops uh, straight down. Leak isn't so much of an issue anymore now that we don't use the volume spirometers anymore. Those were the ones that had bellows or had a cylinder where somebody blew into, and that's what was used to measure. And if they had a leak in it, uh, your, your, in your volume time curve, the volume would drop down over time. In terms of reaching your plateau for your FVC, uh, here's the schematic from that update. And so you, and the way you look at this is if you achieve a true plateau, 
of less than 25 mil in the last second of expiration, then you meet the end of forced expiration criteria. Or if you blow 15 seconds, so if you achieve this earlier than 15 seconds, that's great. For example, kids will frequently uh, empty their lungs really fast uh, and not need to go that long. Uh, if they don't uh, reach a plateau that way, then f uh, greater than equal to 15 seconds meets the end of forced expiration criteria. Uh, or if you don't meet that, the FEC is within the repeatability tolerance or greater than the largest prior observed FEC. And then FEC may still meet usability criteria uh, in kids, uh, if, if, especially in kids, if, if it's repeatable. So the deal with spirometry is still that you do FVC maneuvers until you get three acceptable ones, but you don't do more than eight. Uh, so you do a maximum of eight of eight maneuvers. Uh, so you do uh, the maneuver. Does it meet those criteria for, for that for individual blows to be acceptable? Uh, uh, and then uh, when when you finally achieve uh, uh, you know three measurements and the, the between maneuver criteria are met, you know, then, then you're done uh, and you choose the largest FBC and the largest FB, FEV1 uh, from your group of acceptable blows, from your group of, you know, three best acceptable blows. Doesn't matter, the FBC, the FEV1 can come from different blows. And then for other indices, you use the single bow that has the largest sum of FBC plus FEV1. So the last thing I was going to cover from that update uh, was the grading system for spirometry. Uh, and here's the grading system, and it's A, B, C, D, E, U, and F. Uh, and, and, and as you can see here, an A would be uh, three acceptable maneuvers uh, within uh, uh, 150 mils of each other uh, for, uh, for, an, for someone greater than six years old within 100 uh, milliliters for someone less than six years old. A B uh, would be too acceptable. And then I won't read all the others down for you, you know, but, uh, but basically as they get worse, you have less and less acceptable um, maneuvers and the variability gets greater. Uh, and from, uh, from an earlier update that described this system, tests with a grade of A, B, or C are usable. Uh, tests with a grade D are suspect. Uh, and tests with grade E might be used, but only to show values like if they achieve something that's within the normal range, or to say that something like an FEV1 is at least as high as, uh, but without uh, demonstrated repeatability, and tests with grade F should not be used. Uh, so, so this is an important part of the interpretation of spirometry, is looking at the quality of the test uh, and commenting on the quality of the, the test. And and you know, current software should be able to give you these uh, these uh, quality grades. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to talk about uh, are the ATS ERS uh, uh, tech is is the technical standard on interpretive strategies uh, for routine lung function tests, including spirometry. We're going to focus on spirometry, and the first thing I wanted to talk about was Z scores. And Z scores are, are are a relatively new thing uh, that are being uh, uh, that are being advocated as a way to assess level of of uh, of of normality or abnormality. And what a Z score is? Here's a picture of a normal distribution, right? And and a Z score is equal a Z score of one is one standard deviation away from the mean. Okay, uh, and uh, and so. Uh, in the past, what we've always done with spirometry is we've used uh, the the lower fifth percentile as the threshold for determining whether an FEV1 or an FVC or a ratio are normal or abnormal. And, and in Z scores, uh, the lower fifth percentile is minus 1.645. So that's this dotted line uh, that you see here. Uh, and and that's again, that's the lower fifth percentile. And about one in twenty healthy individuals uh, will have a, a Z score for their FEV1 or their FVC or their FEV1 over FVC uh, of let of a Z score of less than minus one point six four five. Now, as you go out to more and more negative Z scores, 
uh, the probability that a healthy individual would have that abnormal result gets less and less. So you can see here, you know, between minus two and minus three, here's uh, one in 100 uh, healthy individuals having that. If you get to a z-score of minus three, only about one in 1,000 healthy individuals uh, would have a, a z-score that low. Uh, and so uh, this uh, guidance recommended a three-level system to assess the uh, severity of lung function impairment using Z-score values. So basically, Z-scores of greater than minus 1.645 are normal. Okay, so it's minus 1.645 standard deviations below the mean. Z-scores between minus 1.65 and minus 2.5 are mild. Uh, between minus 2.51 and minus 4 are moderate and less than minus 4.1 or severe. So instead of using percent predicted, uh, the recommendation here was to start using the Z scores. So that was a, a big change. And here's an example of, of a Z score. So here's a, a graph of a population, FEV1 on the vertical axis, age on the horizontal axis, each little dot, you know, is a person that was used to develop a reference equation. You see a solid line in the middle, uh, which is the uh, which is the uh, uh, you know calculated uh, uh, percent value for FEV one here from the equation uh, and then upper limit of normal lower limit of normal so a Z score plus one point six four five or minus one point six four five and here you can see an A individual and this A individual you can see the dot is way way far away uh, from the lower limit of normal. And this person has a Z-score of minus 6.8. And here's a, this B person over here. And they're only a little bit away from their lower limit of normal. And so their Z-score is less negative. It's minus 3.2. So the more negative the Z-score, uh, the worse the test. Okay, so that's what's, that's what's recommended now. Another change that was recommended uh, in, in this guidance was a change in the way that we assess bronchodilator response. Uh, and what's currently recommended uh, uh, is that a bronchodilator change, a change of greater than or equal to 10% is now considered a significant bronchodilator response. And the way that you calculate it is you, is you subtract the pre-bronchodilator value from the post-bronchodilator value uh, uh, and divide it by the predicted value and multiply that by 100, okay? So, and, and greater than 10% is now considered uh, to be significant. Here's the approach to interpretation. And again, this is a little bit different uh, than, than what we've done in the past. You know, they key things on the FEV1 or the, over the FVC, and whether it's uh, greater than the fifth percentile, quote unquote normal going to the left, uh, or if it is uh, uh, not greater than the fifth percentile abnormal going to the right, uh, then what you do is you, you divide those by whether the FVC is greater than the fifth percentile. So looking at this row of four towards the bottom, normal spirometry, you would have a normal FEV1 over FVC and a normal FVC. Possible restriction or nonspecific pattern would be normal FEV1 over FVC and reduced FVC. And the reason that they call this now possible restriction or nonspecific pattern is in hospital settings, at least 50% of these people, when you do lung volumes on them, don't have true restriction. Uh, they have spirometric restriction, but they don't have true restriction. Uh, and then over here, uh, if the if the uh, 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 if the FEV1 over FVC is low, uh, and then you check the FVC airflow obstruction, uh, straightforward airflow obstruction is reduced FEV1 over FVC with normal FVC, uh, and then possible mixed disorder, both obstruction and restriction, uh, would be reduced FEV1 over FVC and reduced FVC, uh, and to sort through if you have the possible restriction or nonspecific pattern or the possible mixed disorder in order to figure out what's truly going on you know, from a physiologic basis, you need to do lung volumes uh, to sort that out. So that's a change. Uh, and then this table that I pulled from that guidance gets into things a little bit uh, more. So obstructive impairments, again, uh, normal uh, uh, FVC, reduced FEV1 or FVC, 
Uh, FEV1 may be normal or decreased. Uh, restrictive impairments, uh, reduced FEV1, over, a normal or increased FEV1 over FVC, reduced FVC, reduced FEV1. And you need a TLC you know, to, to uh, uh, confirm uh, a restrictive impairment. You need to document that it's reduced. Nonspecific pattern, uh, it looks on spirometry uh, a lot like a uh, restrictive pattern, you know, but then when you do the lung volumes, you find that that the uh, uh, the TLC is normal. Uh, and also in this pattern, often if you give a bronchodilator, uh, uh, you will uh, uh, see improvement. Uh, muscle weakness, FEV1, FVC, both decreased uh, ratio normal, suboptimal effort the same way. Uh, uh, mixed disorder, uh, all of them uh, will be down, need lung volumes to, to confirm. Uh, and then uh, dyssynapsis uh, is a developmental abnormality where you have different parts of the lung emptying differently. Uh, you'll have a decreased FEV1 over FEC, normal FEV1, a normal FVC. So it may uh, uh, look uh, uh, like an obstruction and, and this may well be a normal variant. So the last thing that I wanted to comment about uh, from that update is they talked about flow volume loops. You know, again, the, uh, the earlier recommendation was that the flow volume loop approach be used for doing all spirometries. Uh, and interpretation of flow volume loops, you know, hasn't changed from the past. Uh, so at the far upper right, you see a normal flow volume loop where it peaks up you know, and comes down on the positive. The positive X values are the expiration, the negative uh, values on the X axis are the inhalation. And you can see uh, the, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the nice rounded <coughs> uh, inspiratory side. Uh, B, uh, the next one over, uh, you see a typical obstruction, you know, where you see the scooping out of the expiratory side. And then severe obstruction is the third one over is C. Uh, uh, and then uh, when, when you go over to uh, uh, D, uh, you can see that you have a normal uh, inspiratory side and you have this sort of amputated. Uh, uh, so you have a normal expiratory side, I'm sorry, and you have this amputated inspiratory side and that's compatible with an extra thoracic large airways obstruction like a tracheal stenosis or something like that. Uh, and then uh, uh, when, when you, uh, uh, you know, come over to E, uh, uh, E is a, 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 uh, is a, 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 a central airways obstruction where you can have, where you have amputation of the expiratory limb, fairly look, normal looking inspiratory limb. Uh, F is a unilateral main stem uh, bronchial obstruction uh, where you have a, uh, 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 when you look at the inspiratory side, you see a, a rapid flow uh, on the inspiratory side, and then and then you know it's not symmetric the way that you would normally see. Uh, and then uh, uh, G uh, is restriction, uh, where you can see that the TLC, you can see that the width of the loop is reduced. Uh, and and then uh, H is a, a mixed disorder, uh, where you can see the obstruction in the expiratory side. So the interpretation of flow volume loops is the same as what it's been in the past. Okay, uh, just a couple words about the standardized pulmonary function report. And I'm just gonna read off these conclusions here. Uh, the only information with val validated clinical application should be included in the report. Uh, the normal limits of each test parameter uh, should be displayed. Uh, consistent with other lab values, the measured value should be shown before reference values, ranges, or normal limits. Uh, uh, and then they, and they have advocate the Z-score uh, in, uh, in, in this guidance document as well. And then for spirometry, many patterns, uh, many parameters can be calculated, but most don't add clinical utility and should not routinely be reported. And so they say that only FEC, FEV1, and the FEV1 or FEC ratio should routinely uh, be reported. Uh, measurement of slow VC and calculation of FEV1 over FEC is a useful adjunct in patients with suspected airflow uh, obstruction. You know, so if you have that non-specific, uh, uh, so so if you have that uh, uh, non-specific pattern, uh, sometimes getting a slow VC can be helpful. 
Uh, and then uh, reporting FEV1 over FEC or FEV1 over VC uh, should be done as a, as a, uh, a decimal fraction. Uh, and that's typically they do that to two places, not as a, uh, not as a percentage, uh, percentage of the predicted value uh, to help minimize uh, miscommunication. And here's a uh, picture of the standardized parametry report. Uh, you can see demographic stuff in the top here, and then you can see that they're uh, reporting FEV, FEC, FEV1, uh, and ratio. Uh, also, on this report, they're reporting forced expiratory time as sort of a quality uh, measure, uh, and you can see that they show the lower limit of normal, uh, the z-score, and the percent predicted uh, uh, value uh, of and for FEV1 and FVC, uh, and and just uh, the uh, uh, lower limit of normal and z-score value for the ratio, and not the percent predicted for that, which they feel is confusing. Uh, and they have a little table here where they show the z-score on the horizontal axis and these stars for the FEV1, FEC, and, and the ratio. Uh, so that's their that's their uh, uh, that's their example of a standardized report. Okay, so now I'm going to finish up with the last uh, uh, set of recommendations, which are probably the most controversial, uh, which uh, came out recently. Uh, and so this is the recommendation on race and ethnicity in pulmonary function uh, test interpretation uh, that came out last year, April, 2023. Uh, and the recommendation was to replace race and ethnicity specific reference equations with race neutral average reference equations, which must be accompanied with a broader reevaluation of how PFTs are used to make clinical employment and insurance uh, decisions. Other recommendations include continued research and education to understand the impact of the change, to improve the evidence for the use of PFTs in general, and to identify modifiable risk factors for reduced pulmonary function. And so, as everybody on this call knows, in the past, uh, the reference equations that we used uh, always included race or ethnicity as one of the variables to determine whether the test was normal or abnormal. Uh, and, and the uh, different uh, equations yielded different predicted values of FEV1, FEC, and FEV1 or FEC uh, for people of different race and ethnicities after adjusting uh, uh, for height uh, and age uh, and sex. Uh, so uh, for example, if, you're, if you were black, uh, it would predict a lower value for you of FEV1 or FVC uh, than if you were if you were white. Uh, and we can see the impact of, of this over here. If you look at the bottom right side, uh, if you apply a single reference equation uh, to whites who are in the clear bars and blacks who are in the blue bars in a population, Blacks tend to have lower values uh, of, of FEV1 uh, uh, than whites. Uh, and that's also true for, for, for FVC. Uh, and if you look over on the left-hand bottom uh, panel, you can see that if you use a race-specific uh, uh, reference equation for FEV1, because it says that Blacks should have lower values if, if for a given age and, and height and sex, the distribution of the blue bars, you know, the curve there uh, looks the same as the distribution of the clear bars. So it normalizes the distributions to look the same, uh, but does it make sense to do that? And that's what the top two graphs address. So if you look at the upper left-hand graph, uh, you can see that the uh, on the vertical axis, there's predicted survival. Uh, and on the horizontal axis, there's Z-score. And recall, the more negative the Z-score, the more severe the impairment, the more positive the Z-score, uh, the greater the level of lung function. And as you can see, if you use a normalized reference equation uh, for every Z-score value, Blacks have lower survival than, than whites. Uh, but if you use, if you move over to the right-hand side uh, and you use a, 
uh, the same prediction equation, the same reference equation for blacks and whites, even though the distribution of values is different for blacks and whites. If you look at the upper right panel, you can see that for each Z score, uh, blacks and whites have the same survival. So what, what uh, you can carry away from this is that even though it's quote unquote normal uh, for a black person of a given uh, age and height and sex uh, to have an FEV1 or, or FVC value uh, that's lower than a, than a similar white person, it's not a good thing to have that lower lung function. Uh, it's associated uh, with, uh, with, with less survival. Uh, and if you look at morbidity, uh, you get the same kind of picture. Uh, so in the two, in the two graphs above, uh, in, in the two panels above, on the left, you have St. George respiratory questionnaire uh, scores. Uh, on the right, you have uh, a CAT test scores. Uh, and the, uh, uh, on the uh, pink or the, the reddish bar is the African-American regression equation using a race-specific equation. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, on, in the darker bar, the, the blue, almost black bar, uh, is a normal, healthy white regression. Uh, and as you can see, again, in the horizontal axis, you have percent predicted FEV1. They didn't do Z-score on this one. But as you can see, for each percent predicted FEV1, uh, 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 whites uh, had better uh, uh, St. George respiratory questionnaire scores uh, uh, than, than Blacks. Uh, and, and the same thing uh, uh, for, for CAT score. Uh, but if you go to a uh, to the bottom two graphs, if you go to a um, uh, to a uh, non-race specific uh, reference equation uh, that's the same for blacks and whites, uh, the two lines showing the relationship between uh, lung function and respiratory symptom score or, or CAT score uh, uh, come together. Uh, so, so again, this is evidence that even though it's quote unquote normal for, for blacks uh, to have lower lung function, it's not a good thing. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, if you normalize the reference equation, uh, you normalize away uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the health effects of having lower lung function. So we don't know why different races and different ethnicities have lower lung function. Uh, it's been, uh, if you, especially if you look at, at the adult level, you know, there are different ways people can get to their different lung function. This shows lung function over time, you know, antenatal, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, uh, and people get to lung function in adult, uh, at, at a given point in time in their adulthood as a result of lung growth. Uh, and then your lung function peaks up, usually in your mid to late 20s, and then your lung function declines after that. So if you have abnormal lung function when you're adult, it could mean either you never developed a, a full amount of lung function, or it could mean that you had an accelerated decline in lung function uh, after you got to your to your peak. You know, we don't know why that is. So one thing that's been postulated is that if people have lower socioeconomic status, if they live in places where there's more air pollution, uh, if they don't, you know, have good nutrition, you know, maybe that uh, affects lung function. That's been postulated. Another thing that's been postulated are anthropomorphic kinds of things like different ratios between chest size and total height. None of those things completely have explained uh, differences in lung function between race and ethnicity so far. Uh, I don't think we have any definitive reason why, but the bottom line is it's still bad to have low lung function uh, for your age and your height and, and your sex. Uh, and, and, and so it's probably not a good thing to normalize that away. The last thing I wanted to talk about uh, was a race, uh, was this last uh, um, uh, paper that I'm going to cover is a, a, new, uh, 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 a new reference equation uh, that's been proposed 
uh, for interpreting lung function measurements. And this is the one that folks in ATS have talked a lot about using. Uh, this is the uh, GLI global equation. And, and the GLI global equation, uh, it comes uh, from the same population that was used to generate the GLI 2012 uh, race specific equation. You can see it over on the right side. So 42,000 women, almost 32,000 uh, men, uh, uh, ranging in age, uh, uh, the range of the equation is age three uh, to age 95. Uh, and basically what they did uh, was if you look down here at the bottom, you can see the different races and ethnicities. And this is different than the GLI um, mixed equation that was in the GLI 2012. That GLI mixed equation used all comers and it didn't weight uh, the different groups. This GLI global, it weights the different ethnic groups. So the ones that were uh, where there were lesser numbers in the study, uh, uh, they got weighted more to try to average things out more. So it's a little bit different. Uh, and it's it's kind of complicated. Uh, this is the lookup table. There's an Excel file that's attached to the paper uh, that allow that provides you uh, the uh, uh, the numbers that you need to uh, to uh, calculate the predicted FEV1, FVC, and FEV1 over FVC for men and women. And this is just, I took a couple snippets from that table. And you can see this is pretty complicated. For each age, you get something called an M spline, an S spline, and an L spline. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, what you do is, uh, is you can plug the M spine, the S spline, and the L spline into these different equations uh, to uh, 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 to calculate the uh, 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 the uh, uh, the median uh, uh, and the lower limit of normal uh, and the percent predicted. So you know basically uh, it's 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 fairly you know it's fairly complex math uh, for each combination of age uh, and height. Uh, and sex. So here are the uh, uh, here are graphs of the GLI global and uh, the 2021 global and the 2012 other. Uh, the global is darker uh, and the 2012 is lighter. And as you can see, they actually are pretty close to each other, except at the, at the extremes of age. Uh, the solid lines uh, are the predicted values, the dotted lines are the lower limits of normal. Uh, and as you can see uh, for FEV1, FEC, FEV1 over FEC, they're actually reasonably close. Uh, although the GLI global uh, predicts somewhat higher values than the GL, GLI 2012 other uh, at older ages. So what's the impact of this? So so if you look at the um, uh, at the impact of switching equations, and we'll we'll focus here just on uh, the three bars uh, to the left, NHANES white and NHANES black. So if you apply uh, the GLI uh, global and the GLI other equation uh, to whites and blacks, the very first bar here, uh, the light bar uh, with the whiskers on it. Uh, is the race specific equation. And you can see for whites and blacks, it gives you an FV, FEV1 Z score of about zero, of right about normal. Uh, if you go to the uh, uh, GLI uh, uh, global, which is the, which is this, I believe that's the second bar, it's covered up on my thing, but I think that's the second bar is the GLI global with the, with the, with the darker box. You can see that for whites, it causes them to have a positive Z-score. And the reason for that is that the GLI global gives a lower predicted value for whites uh, than the race-specific race equation would. So it makes uh, whites appear to have uh, a greater than normal uh, lung function on the average. And that effect is even greater for the GLI other. Uh, if you look at blacks, it's the, it's the opposite. Uh, because the GLI global and the GLI other uh, predict higher uh, FEV1 and FVC levels for Blacks uh, than, uh, uh, than the race-specific equation, it causes them to, as it causes Blacks as a population uh, to have lower Z-scores. Uh, and so there's been, you know, a lot of, 
where, where there's been a controversy about that is the whole issue of thresholds and how that applies to thresholds, for example, for compensation. Uh, so I'll just finish up really quickly here uh, and, and say that, um, uh, that uh, we did a brief introduction. We talked about the flow volume loop. Uh, we talked about review of recent recommendations in the GLI Global Supermetry Reference Equation. We talked about acceptability and quality grading, which is really an important part of interpretation. The switch to the Z-score instead of percent predicted value to assess presence and severity of abnormality. Bronchodilator response is now 10% is the threshold. General approach to interpretation. Uh, the standard report format, just focusing on FEV1, FEC, and the ratio, uh, and the transition uh, that's been recommended to not using race and ethnicity in reference equations anymore, to going to the GLI global equation, which we discussed, which goes from ages 3 to 95. All right, so I'll stop there, and I think we have a few minutes for discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Weissman. Great presentation. You covered so much wonderful information there. Um, but yeah, we'll just open up for questions, comments from the group, and you're welcome to chat in as well, and I'm happy to read it out loud. Uh, Martine, I see you uh, chatted. You have a couple of questions. You're welcome to unmute and ask away. And I believe you are still muted. And you can also chat in your questions if you'd like. And Dr. Wernsey saw you had unmuted as well, maybe. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Martin, I see you unmuted now. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can yes, hear Yes, we can. You. Okay, sorry, thank you. I. I, again, I apologize, I'm on my phone. Um, so I have a quick question. So we have a nine hospital system and we're really grappling with the neutral, um, the gl global neutral equation. One of the pulmonary groups is asking for specific examples of using the regular GLI 2012 and then the race neutral. Do you have like any samples of specific like um tests that were run through using both and seeing the differences in values. They're, they're really trying to make the right decision. I think it also kind of was stems out of this is a two-part question with the fact that there was another article and I can't search it because my computer's down. I have no internet. But there was a specific article um, saying that because of the neutral equation that Blacks would be excluded from potential life-saving measures because of how severe their lung disease is with the neutral equation. I'll take a breath now. So basically, did you see that article? And I can't remember who the author was. And the other first part of it is, do you have specific examples of how it changed the values? So that I think they're trying to wrap their heads around, is this the right thing to do for our patients? And B, then they need to explain this to primary care docs. So anything you can add would be great. Thank you. Sure. Well, this has been hugely controversial, uh, and and because uh, you know because uh, uh, forever the uh, lung you know the the uh, standard equations normalized you know values for for you know for blacks and whites, and there's been a lot that's been published on how these equations change things for individual patients. So if you search on David Menino, uh, Mary Townsend, uh, uh, they've they've published a fair amount. Uh, uh, they published some commentaries on this. Uh, uh, Meredith McCormick, uh, 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 who is on the ATS side, has has published some. You know, but but basically, what happens is if a reference equation uh, predicts too high of a value for you as an individual, right? You're more likely to be classed as uh, as abnormal, uh, uh, and you may be called abnormal even if you're not. Now that can have benefits and that can have harms. Uh, the benefits can be uh, if the prediction value is too high for someone, they may qualify for benefits that they wouldn't otherwise qualify for, uh, uh, or uh, or they may qualify for treatments, you know, uh, with a lesser degree of disease uh, than somebody else uh, would qualify for. But there may be harms. 
they may, may be overdiagnosed uh, with disease that they don't have, uh, which could affect them from the standpoint of insurance or, or ability to get a job. And then it's the inverse. If a reference equation under predicts, you know, says that you're too low, uh, uh, predicts a value that's too low for you as an individual, you may have quite a bit of disease by the time you finally uh, show up as abnormal on that test. Uh, and, and so basically what this has called out uh, is that, that there's been probably been too much reliance on spirometry as a single test uh, to assess if somebody has disease or not and assess the severity of their disease. So I think it's really important to consider spirometry together with other things. You know, what are people's symptoms? What are their physical findings? You know, potentially other tests. You know, uh, uh, you know, I think you know thresholds like you can get surgery if you're above this value. You know, uh, we already have recommendations that that instead of saying that there's a single threshold, uh, we have recommendations that say if you're above a certain level, you're okay. If you're below a certain level, you're not okay. And if you're between, you need an exercise test. So it may be that we're getting to the point where we need to kind of work in. Uh, uh, you know, additional considerations, especially if people are, are, you know, in the gray zone. So I hope that kind of answers your question, but there's a lot that's out there. There's been a lot of concern about this, and this will probably change the way that spirometry, is, you know, is used and probably appropriately so. It probably never was right to say that if you're a little bit above some threshold, you're okay. And if you're a little bit below it, you're not, you know, life isn't that simple. Thanks, Dr. Weissman. And Martin, did you have another question there? I know you said you had a couple. Well, just I wonder if he has any specific examples of run through the regular GLI 2012 and then the race neutral to compare the values. Are you aware of any papers that did that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, um, uh, uh, Mary Townsend, uh, uh, T-O-W-N-S-E-N-D, uh, 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 David Menino, even the paper that I referenced for you, the one on um, the one on, on uh, you know, on race specific, uh, you know, equations, you know, by Bakta et al. Uh, it's got a nice figure where it shows like, you know, scenarios for individuals. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah. And, and again, you know, what's going to happen is if you're black, uh, the uh, equation, you know, the reference equation will will give you a higher predicted value, so you're more likely uh, uh, to uh, to be abnormal. Uh, and if you're white, it'll give you a lower predicted value, so you're uh, less likely to be abnormal. Thank you so much. And Dr. Warrens, I noticed you had unmuted earlier too. You had a question or comment? I do. Quick question. So my read, my understanding is that the current, the new recommendation, the 2019 recommendation, is that each part of the maneuver is rated as um, normal, severe, very severe, all that stuff for the FEV1, FEC, and F and the ratio. And my question is, how? While that might be useful for a, as you know, a new, very nuanced version for a pulmonologist, how do you communicate that to a patient that you've got a normal this and a severely that and a moderate this um, in their in their result. And how do you give them an actual result um, based upon this new grading scale of using Z-scores for each part of the test separately? Carl, I think the pattern is really important too. You know, so, so you know, do they have obstruction? Uh, uh, do they have possible restriction? Uh, uh, you know, do they have a mixed pattern? You know, and and you know, in you know, and personally, you know, I feel like you know the 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 key number for obstruction is their FEV one, right? Uh, and for you know restriction, it's it's the FVC or or the TLC are are probably the most telling, right? And that together with their symptoms and and their other tests, again, you know, I think spirometry shouldn't be used in isolation, right? I mean, there's the full picture. No, no, I understand. It's just, yeah, um, said, what I would love to see is the people who, is the, the 2017 paper on 
um, reporting results to come after the 2019 paper because they've really, um, you know, they, they've, I think they've made it much harder to, to explain it to a patient. Um, yeah. And so it might be useful for a pulmonologist. It, explain it to a patient is way harder if you try and follow 2019 the way it's written. Yeah. But well, thank I mean, you very much you know, for the talk. It was a good talk. Well, the adjectives, you know, are still the same. The adjectives are still, you know, you know, normal, mild, moderate, severe, right? I mean, so, you know, so, you know, you have obstruction, you know, your 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 spirometry shows that you have obstruction, you know, and it's mild and you know, it gets better with bronchodilator or it doesn't. I mean, that hasn't changed. No, what's what's hard is that that if somebody has severe restriction and mild obstruction, so they're mixed pattern, right? Um, but you've got three different know, qualifications, adjectives, whatever the right word is, um, that you're using. That, that's just my question. I, I, it, I'm, I'm still wrapping my head around that part of this because it's kind of confusing yeah. to be able to explain it to patients. But thank you, Roger. It was a good talk and a good review of the con the complex issues that are being introduced here. Yeah, and and you know, Dan asked the question. You know, Dan put a comment in the in the chat. You know, you know about you know you know implications for prognosis. You know, and, and again, I mean, you know, the worse your lung function, you know, you know, the 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 worse your prognosis, right? I mean, you know, I mean, lung function is one of those things that clearly gets worse with age. You know, and you know, if you don't get to a good peak in life, and then if you decline rapidly, you know that that and you know that. Those aren't good things, and and uh, and lower lung function on average is associated with greater you know morbidity and mortality. I mean, so you know that hasn't changed. You know, but, yeah, no, but I'm just wanting this to be better. Like FEV one Q is an awesome thing to predict death, but I hope we can be a little more elegant than that. It, yeah, it's, and, it's, and it's and the only thing it's norm norm for is predicting death, which is I pray not what we're doing. Yeah, and what Carol was talking about with FEV1Q for those who don't know is uh, the, is like the like the lower like one percentile something like that of of of, of value for uh, uh, for uh, FEV1 uh, for men and women. Uh, it, it, for men, it's like five hundred mil, and for women, it's like four hundred mil. And some have uh, suggested that instead of using absolute values. Uh, that that we express lung function as like how many uh, FEV1Q units you have, you know. So if you were like a man and you had one liter, you would in it, you would have an FEV1Q of like two, uh, you know. And uh, you know, so that would be like how much capacity you have to just stay alive. Uh, and and you know, and and that a lot of interest in that, and that that's still being studied. So thank you so much. Any other questions, comments from the group? Dr. Doyle, did you have a comment? I, I'm gonna be still in the interest of time. I put in, but, but I would love to come back to this again. There's so much here. Absolutely, I 100% second that. I think it would be great to have a follow-up on this topic and maybe even have it as like a panel style. So um, the other hub members on the call could also chime in if um, you know they have more to say, but. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Weissman, for your time and um, for sharing your knowledge on all this wonderful stuff. Um, we really appreciate you. So um, as you said, Dr. Doyle, for the interest of time, I will just get into the announcements. Um, the only announcement is that the next time we'll meet is on February 19th. And Dr. Doyle, I have you down um, with some of your colleagues as well to discuss West Virginia's clear future, catch my breath. Um, so really excited to listen more about that. Uh, we wish you all a really wonderful holiday season, a happy new year. I hope you all stay safe and warm. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much. We'll see you all in 2024. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.